Hi, Terry from CTV Calgary. Yeah. Thanks for taking my question. I'm just wondering, as we talk about new schools and keeping up with mm -hmm. enrollment, does this funding do, um, is there any allocated funding for more teachers? I can get the um, the education minister to uh, to come up. We did announce some additional operational uh, funding over the summer, so we have funding for more modulars, but we also have funding to be able to manage growth pressures. And we're working now on identifying if we need to modify our funding model. The funding model was working for us when we had declining enrollment, declining population, um, and it was it works for declining school boards because it's a three-year weighted average, and it's to protect school boards so that they don't end up with a dramatic reduction. Um, with this huge surge, it's, it's not as responsive as we need it to be for enrollment growth. So. The minister is going through the Treasury Board process and, and working on uh, an alternative model. Did you want to say more about that? I don't think we've got an answer yet, but how much did we put in uh, for the uh, the short-term measure to help with the, with the hiring? 125 million we announced a few weeks ago to be able to help with this school year. But there'll be, there'll be more to say in the upcoming budget, which will be delivered in February. Okay, and can we get a breakdown for the 8.6, um, how much will go to public, charter, private? Do you have the answer to that, Pete? Well, look, I mean, a part of it is that we want to change the process so that as the projects become ready, they're able to move more quickly through the process. Because I think everybody puts in their capital plan and then they wait with bated breath to see if it's going to be approved in the, uh, in the upcoming budget. What we want to say is if you're ready, we're ready to be with you on that. There's a process that the minister goes through along with the Minister of Infrastructure to make sure that the, the sites and the projects are ready to go. And that's really going to be the only barrier. We want to make sure that the land uh, ownership is clear. We want to make sure the site is serviced. We want to make sure all the permits are done. And then we'll be prepared to, to meet the school boards as they come up. But I, I don't believe, I, I, I would anticipate that the number of Catholic schools versus public schools would be equivalent to the student enrollment. And I think this student enrollment is about, I want to say one third in Catholic versus public. Yeah, so probably about, you'd expect of the, that that would be the rough ratio. And then there's also 12,500 spaces that we'll be doing for charter schools. Have we identified how many will be independent schools or is that just uh, going to, we'll just have to see what the demand is on the, on the independent schools. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Premier Kelly Kreiderman, Globe and Mail. Yeah. I don't think anybody's going to uh, raise any doubts about the fact that we need new schools in Alberta, but with a major address like this and the money involved, do you have to be more clear about the debt the province will have to take on in order to fund these schools and how that will play out in next year's budget process? Sure, I mean, I'll, I can be very clear about it. Um, Minister Guthrie did uh, some great work in the, in the spring session, um, working as well with Minister uh, Nicolaides to figure out a new funding model for schools because part of what has happened in the past is that when we fund it as a, a transfer, it comes out of operational spending and that by its very nature limits the number that we can approve each year. So what we'll be doing on a go forward is that uh, we will be owning the infrastructure we build. And so that allows for us to amortize the, uh, the projects over the lifetime of the project. As you heard from our school board representatives, some of these schools last 50 years. Um, and so we want to be able to match that with our borrowing. So it'll come on our books as a capital asset, and it will come on our books as a capital liability. And then we will service the debt based on what makes sense from a treasury board perspective. That's how we'll be funding it. And that's, and, and that's the reason why we've been able to accelerate it, is we, we just simply wouldn't have been able to have this volume of funding if it was the traditional grants-based process. You're asking municipalities and school boards to gear up and to prepare yep. for this, yet this week we're seeing a debate play out in, in the city of Calgary about the Green Line, mm. where money that was promised by the province has been cancelled and now the city is having to deal with the ramifications of that. How are municipalities and school boards going to have trust that you will follow through with your funding pledges here? The, the money that we have pledged for the Green Line is still there. Um, I would say that we want the Green Line to be as it was initially pitched to us. We want it to go to Seton so that it services the, the hospital and services Quarry Park and services the areas where the people are. We want the Green Line to go to 160th in the north, as it was promised, to be able to service the, uh, the communities there as well. 
what we kept observing, and we kept on having the conversation with the city as they get got more and more budget constraints, was don't cut the south part of the line, cut some of the expensive downtown part of the line. And uh, when it got to a point now where this incredible shrinking project is now, what, seven stops, nine kilometers, uh, at a cost of $600 million per kilometer, if it continues to be built out at that rate, it'll be a $20 billion project. Uh, Calgarians can't afford that, we can't afford it, the feds can't afford it. So there needed to be a rethink on this, and we, are, we remain committed. I was very pleased to see that a motion that uh, Sonia Sharp put forward to ask us to work collaboratively on putting a steering committee together with representatives from the city, the province, and the federal government so that we could work through what that new proposal looks like. Uh, passed 8-7, it was tight, but you know, thank you to all the council members who are, are willing to engage with us in, uh, in good faith. We'll reach out to our federal counterparts to see if they want to participate in that because the federal funding is going to be very important. I understand there's some time limits on that that uh, because of the way it's been granted, it needs to be spent by um, March of 2025 or committed by March of 2025. And, and I think that we've, that we've done this before. We, we came to the table to assist the city in getting to a final agreement on the event center with us coming in as the capital partner on infrastructure. So I, I feel like these collaborative processes will really work. What I, what I fear has happened with the Green Line is that it didn't have effective, consistent political oversight. And that's part of the reason why it's gone completely out of control. I think that what um, Calgarians want is they want a line that goes to where the people are, and that's what we're committed to build. Hi, Paula Tran from Livewire Calgary. Um, these infrastructure problems, they've been existing for years, and also operational problems. So why is the government um, announcing these um, funding now instead of funding over the years? Well, well, look, I mean, we, we didn't have the acute nature of this problem because um, in 2020, 2014, we, of course, uh, suffered a major decrease in our economic growth. We had 13 quarters of out-migration, and that began to turn around in 2022. It's, um, it's part of the reason why when we looked at 2023, we had 200,000 people come to our province in that year from a variety of different uh, places. And and, and we ha have done our best to accommodate them on the infrastructure that we have. But every time I talk to a school board chair, I heard the same story, especially the big school boards. And it's the same with, Cath with the Catholic boards in both cities as well. Like they're talking about the need to have 40, 50 schools built in the next 10 years. I don't know the last time the Calgary Board of Education had a 96% utilization rate, but they normally try to have an 85% utilization rate to be able to offer all of their programming. And so um, a number of months ago, I asked Demetrios to uh, to find a new model for how we would be able to fund uh, infrastructure. I said, we, we just have to build at an accelerated rate. And that's part of why the legislation came through from uh, that Minister Guthrie led in the spring, and it's allowed for us to, to be able to do this kind of acceleration. And it really was just the unique circumstances of 2023, with so many people coming in at once. That's the, the highest level of people moving to Alberta that we've seen in our history. So that's, that's part of the reason. If we have to respond to the pressures of managing growth, and, and that's what this announcement's about. In your, um, you're asking schools to come up with proposals for these new builds, so mm -hmm. why is the responsibility being put on the schools to find the space for these new builds? It always has been. Um, the, so the process that we have with our school boards is every year they give us their capital plan, and then they prioritize what their number, uh, their, their top priorities are for full replacements, um, modernizations and new builds. And then we always face the very difficult challenge looking at the budget of what do we say yes to and, and what has to be put off. And so we, we know we can't do that um, with the, this volume of, of, uh, of newcomers and this volume of kids who are in the system. We, we have to be able to meet every school board with their most urgent needs in an accelerated way. And that's what we wanted to do with, the, with this process. But it's always been the case that the, uh, the school boards have, have led the effort. We just have had to be a lot more uh, strict in the number that we could approve each year because of budget limitations. But with the new way that we're going to be financing these, it allows for us to build as they become ready. Hi, Premier. Uh, Michael King with uh, Global News. You talk about private schools. Mm -hmm. Private schools need this additional funding, and when you say it comes at a discount to the taxpayer, how does that compare to the per cost of the uh, spots in the pro uh, public sector? The uh, the cost per student in the uh, public system is about ten to eleven thousand. I'm looking at my minister. 
um, but the overall amount that we pay in the public system is, is between 10 and 11,000. We can probably try to get a more precise number. We, with the independent schools, we only fund them at 70% of the operational grant. So I believe that's about uh, 5,300 around there right now. So that gives you an idea of, uh, of where the, the discount comes in. And so we're, we're putting it out there as a, a pilot to see if there is any interest in, in partnering on the same basis that we'll be building the other schools with the different school boards. And on the green line, is the province ready to take over the project and specifically the 70 contracts that are tied to that? Look, we, we need to rethink the, uh, the way that the green line is being built. And I would say where the agreement is, is that we all agree that there needs to be a, uh, a station at the event center as well as going out to Linwood. That's, those are the ones that have already been done on the engineering, the planning. We just want it to go further. We want it to go out to Seton, which was the uh, original part of the plan. And there needs to be more work done to figure out a way to integrate it into the red and blue lines. And so that's what we've hired ACON to do. We just inked the deal yesterday. We have a number of different uh, uh, items that we're going to ask them to look at to see if there's a better way to have it integrated into downtown. Like, remember, when this was first conceived of, it was not conceived of as a single continuous project. And I think this is part of the reason why. If you look at the former transit boss, who I think the next person in line has interviewed, um, he said that it, um, it, the, one of the difficulties came when the announcement was made would be that it would be a single continuous line from Seton all the way to 160th, and no one even asked the experts whether it could be done. And now we're seeing, suppose engineers are pretty smart, Peter will tell you that, he's one himself. They can figure out a lot of stuff, but it's very expensive. And so that's the question, is are we getting what we need for Calgarians? And what Calgarians need is they need to have the stations close to where they live so that it's actually usable for them. So I want to continue working with the city on that. I want to work with the federal government on that. And I, I think we'll, we'll be able to come up with a proposal in pretty short order. I think ICON has uh, uh, give, been given a time frame of December. And we know what the pressures are to be able to get the federal government to, to partner with us on it. So we're, we're going to be moving very quickly. Rick Bell, Post Media. On the Green Line, one of my favorite topics. I bet. You've been writing a lot on it. <laughs> Twelve years I've been writing about this, uh, this deal. Um, you, you talk about working with the city and you talk about mm -hmm. that there was a vote eight to seven to have a working group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in reality, if you watched that council meeting yesterday, it was very emotional, very animated, very hostile. Mm -hmm. In fact, even one of the councillors who's usually on the council majority, veteran councillor said, he would be happy if you would come to city council, ask for permission to speak, apologize to them, and then beg them <laughs> to work with you. Um, and we also have the mayor who's used many very strong words addressing your decision, very strong. In fact, she even has a new website now. Um, so how do you square that? How do you square with the fact that you want to work, you say you want to work with the city, but yet there is outright hostility over your decision among many city politicians, including the mayor? Look, I mean, it was a tight vote, obviously, eight to seven. Uh, but that still shows me that the majority of council has, uh, are entering with a, a, a spirit of goodwill in uh, trying to find a solution. That's what we all want. We want a solution that, that comes close to looking something like the original plan we were pitched on. And I feel like that is what we owe uh, Alberta taxpayers and what we owe Calgarian taxpayers is we got to do our darndest to get at least the South Line built out to Seton. And then this next stage, and I've already told the mayor this, if we can come to an agreement on that, then we can talk about how we get the North Line serviced. But we've, we've got to at least have one part of this line built as it was originally pitched to us, to the feds, and to, and to Calgarians. And the second question is kind of a clarification. It was asked earlier, but it's been repeated by council members, and I think they're wrong, but I'd, you can confirm whether they are or not. They talk about wanting you to take over the project. Now, my understanding is you're willing to fund something, you're just not willing to fund what they had on the table. We're, we're so therefore, it's, it's still a Calgary, no, tell me if I'm right, it, it's still, a Calgary Transit project, yeah. you're just saying that in December you're going to go back to the city, 
You're going to say, here are some alternatives we are willing to yep. consider, but you're not taking, you're not taking, it's still their project. It's but, just that you don't want to fund their design. You want to fund another design. That, that's how we would hope it would work. I think that's the, the most constructive way to work because it has to be integrated into Calgary City Transit. That said, we also have a, um, a, a major passenger rail uh, proposal that we've uh, we've put out to to uh, to, to get a response on. I think we we have a 15 million dollar RFP that we've uh, delivered so that someone can uh, so the company I'm not sure who won that that bid that company can tell us how all of these things would be integrated because we have a, a number of different proponents for a number of different projects. There's like a hyperloop and there's a Ellis Dons proposal from Calgary to Edmonton and then there's the BAM Trail proposal and then there is a proposal for how we might be able to build Calgary or Airdrie to, to Okotoks as commuter rail and uh, and as well as integrate with our existing system. I mean, we're, we're very complicated now. Um, uh, Toronto was in this exact same position when they launched their Ontario Metro links so that they could co coordinate between buses, both local and regional, uh, transit, both uh, re local and regional, as as well as the GO train, and I feel like we, we've that's the conversation that we need to have: is how do we make all of these pieces fit together? So I don't want to prejudge what that might look like, but that's the reason why we have to be a lot more involved in this. It's it's not it's not Calgary's job to fall, to solve all of the problems for the entire Calgary metro region, or figure out a way to be able to get service between Calgary and and Edmonton. That by definition, because it goes cross jurisdiction, is our job to, to solve. So. We want to be partners, but we don't want to take over the transit system, no. We just you're want to make buying, sure... You're not buying the green line. We're not, no. We're, we want to be able to fund a green line that was originally pitched to us, going out to Seton. Okay. Thanks, Premier. We're now going to go to the phones. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? Thank you. Your question comes on the line of Scott Streeter from Calgary Herald and Sun. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you. This is another green, broad, uh, green line question, but... Can the province deliver a, a train project in Calgary without the city's involvement? Because the city is quite adamant that uh, that this project is is dead in their view. Well, I I would say eight out of seven council members voted to work with us on figuring out an alternative path and see if we can uh, figure out a routing that looks closer to what was originally pitched on this. So I would say that that actually represents the true view of the majority of council. Okay. Follow-up is about another uh, amendment that was introduced yesterday by Councillor Courtney Walcott um, about drafting a clear set of criteria by which the city would consider engaging with the province on any future LRT project. They propose to replace the Green Line program with uh, the criteria include a lot of the things that were included in the previous vision, such as a, a north-south LRT sign from 160th Avenue to the mm -hmm. community of Seton, et cetera. Um, is, is the province willing to abide by those criteria? Well, look, I mean, you have to remember, we were pitched initially on a 46-kilometer line that would go from Seton to 160th at a cost of $4.6 billion. It kept on shrinking and shrinking and shrinking to a point where this tiny little stub of a line doesn't serve either the Deep South or the Deep North. So yes, I welcome some a kind of uh, collaborative agreement so that we can make sure that we're all working towards the same objective. I think that uh, as this project began shrinking, it became pretty clear to us that it, it really wasn't serving anyone. And that's why we had to step in, put on the brakes and see if we could get back to the original vision. Great. Operator, next caller, please. Your next question comes from the line of Janet French from CBC Edmonton. Please go ahead. Good morning. Just back to the, uh, the schools. So hearing you describe how you're going to account for all these projects on your books, talking about amortizing them over the lifetime of the project, does that mean that all new school projects in Alberta are going to be P3s? And if not, can you please clarify what will be P3s and which won't? Well, they'll, they'll be provincially owned, but um, I, I'll, let, I'll let Pete maybe come up to talk about our strategy around how we, uh, how we build. We've actually gotten quite expert at this, so I'll, I'll let uh, Pete tell you what we do. Yeah, uh, from a P3 perspective, uh, all projects uh, within infrastructure that are 100 million or more, we evaluate, we evaluate for uh, P3 viability. Uh, they don't all uh, make it but uh, we have a responsibility uh, as a government to use uh, 
public funds uh, the most effectively and efficiently that we can. So if there is value for money, uh, we, we will go through with P3. So I would say that some of these will be three, P3 packages, uh, but, but certainly not all of them. Okay, just to follow up on the private school construction incentive, what is this incentive pilot? Like what proportion of the construction cost would be incentivized? And is this the first time in Alberta history that the government would pay for any construction costs towards private schools? Um, I don't know if this is the first time in history that we, we want to pay for it. We want to put all of the different school options on the same level playing field. That's why with us owning the, uh, the construction, owning the project, that allows for us to be able to look at a, a number of different uh, unique approaches to be able to support independent uh, charter as well as our, our, two, um, our two major school boards, public and, and private in both cities or in, I guess all across the province, we've got both public and private. Do you want to add to that? I mean, I think we, we can't, we want to see what the pitch comes in from the independent schools, and then we'll have to judge it at that, at that time. Yeah, as the, as the Premier noted, uh, we'll, we're in the process now of developing what that pilot will look like. Uh, of course, there's a couple of different possibilities and options. We want to talk with our independent school providers to see uh, what would work and what makes the most sense for government and for them uh, so that we can explore that partnership. And I think the important thing with this partnership is uh, making sure that we have all hands on deck. Uh, you know, the enrollment pressures that we are seeing warrant us to use every possible avenue that we can to expand spaces, to reduce class sizes, and to make sure that those kids receive the highest quality education possible. Great. Operator, next caller, please. Your next question comes from the line of Lisa Johnson from Canadian Press. Please proceed. Hi, thanks. I, I have a question. I'm hoping that Julie and Patricia can weigh in on this. Um, obviously, we're hearing a lot of questions about the Green Line uh, today, but I'm, I'm wondering, Julie, you mentioned there's 12 projects that are on track and ready for 2025. Patricia, you mentioned there's 13 site and shovel ready projects. Um, what confidence do you each have that this government will actually get this money out the door, given it's just pulled 1.53 billion from the, the Green Line project, and the province has made it very clear this funding is very contingent on school boards and municipalities getting sites ready? Well, I'll I'd happily have Patricia and, and Julie come up and, and talk about our, our record. Pete was telling me that we've, we've, we've built 18 schools a year as sort of our, our traditional amount of school build, and I, I think we've got an excellent process for it. Um, Mayor So he sent me a note last night saying we're ready to go, and so he's reached out not only to the school boards already, but also to me directly as well. So I'm I'm feeling pretty good about their ability to meet the permitting and site readiness, and the school boards uh, have assured us as well. You heard today that they've got schools that are, are ready to go. So we want to be able to accelerate that. Julie or or um, or Patricia, did you want to come up? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I can't speak to anything to do with the Green Line. That is not in my scope. But uh, what I can say is I'm here to celebrate this this new program where we can move through the stages and celebrate the, you know, $8 billion that's being committed to this. Uh, I'm here because I, I'm hoping that all of this comes to fruition and, and I have no reason to think that it won't. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and to say that we do have, you know, our 12 projects in year one on track to be ready for budget 25 and we are going to be working very diligently with the city of edmonton to make sure year two and three and any additional sites will also be ready on time for the following year thanks thanks Thank you. Well, I'd also say that the Green Line does not impact any um, school construction in Calgary. And we do work closely with the city to ensure sites are ready and would not put them on our capital plan year one until they are. So as mentioned before, we have 13 sites that are uh, school ready. And as we mentioned, these are needs, not wants. And we hope that those are expedited quickly to get kids in the schools so they don't have to attend overflow schools or take the bus out of their communities. Okay, um, thanks everyone. We have time for one more question, so I'm gonna come back to per in, the, in the room. Go ahead, yeah. Good morning, Premier. Uh, Logan Stein, 660 News Radio. 
Some members of City Council have claimed the province's recent comments about the Green Line and the state of the deal is solely being used as a political weapon against the opposition, especially considering Minister Drieschen's statement taking shots at how Mayor, uh, former Mayor Nenshi handled the situation when he was Mayor of Calgary. Kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that and how you think Nenshi handled the project while he was Mayor of Calgary. Look, the, the thing that I think uh, caused some of the problems was when there was a change in government at the municipal level, decision making ceased to have political oversight. That's where I think the fundamental problem began, because I think decisions were made at that point that kept a lot of council members in the dark. For instance, why did they have? A, a, what is the a fixation on going to Eau Claire? What is the contracts that have been signed there? We've been asking for what the commitment is there. We're trying to understand how that decision was made. But I can tell you, council members were left in the dark on that. And it's part of the reason why I think everything has been centered around a single option. I don't think that there has been the fulsome discussion about how do we get the line fully out to Seton. That's what we needed to stop and restart. So, um, so that's why we're trying to reset to make sure that there is better political oversight um, so that any major decision that's being made that has multi-billion dollar implications has all of the funding partners in, uh, included in it. And so we'll, we'll take that under advisement as we move forward with uh, all of our other uh, capital projects. But I think that this is a learning lesson for all of us. And uh, do you feel as if there will be a rift between how the provincial government works with city council moving forward, considering everything that's kind of happened over the last month? Look, I mean, I, uh, th there are things that I get along with our federal counterparts on and things that we don't get along on. There are things that I, I get along with, with uh, mayors on and things that I don't. And I, I suspect that this will hopefully, um, because eight of, out of seven of the council members have, uh, have the, uh, the goodwill to want to move forward with us to try to figure out um, a, a new approach that will allow us to get further on south out to Seton. I'm, I'm taking that as a, a measure that they want to work with us. And so we will we'll, we'll put forward a a, a committee and we'll get to work on that and then hopefully when ICON gives us the uh, proposal in December we'll be able to have something to work with but we're, we've already reached out to our federal counterparts we want them to be a, a, a more embedded in this process as well and I think we'll get a better answer that will not only be more cost effective but it will get us uh, get the get the, the line where it needs to go which is in the deep into the deep south awesome. thank you thank you okay thanks everyone